Hi everyone, welcome to the UK AEA Fusion Tutorials. This is a series designed to give you a basic understanding of fusion energy and our research here at the UK Atomic Energy Authority. My name is Gary Kurzgeeker and I'm on the graduate scheme here at UK AEA. I work in the Hydrogen 3 Advanced Technology Department, or HEAT Department for short, as a graduate tritium scientist slash engineer. This second fusion tutorial is about magnetism and magnetic confinement and how they relate to fusion energy. Today I'm going to be answering these four questions. What are magnetic and electric fields? Why do we need to confine a plasma? How do we confine a plasma using a magnetic field? And are there other methods of confining a plasma? First, let's answer the first question. What are magnetic and electric fields? Well, magnetic and electric fields arise when charged particles interact. In fact, magnetic fields, electric fields, and charged particles are all related. Let's learn about this in a bit more detail by first learning a bit more about magnetic fields. Charged particles experience forces due to magnetic fields. But let's look at this map bar magnet first. We've all seen one of these before. The red side represents the North Pole and the blue side represents the South Pole. We know that opposites attract and like poles repel. So if you place this small bar magnet here, we know that it would be attracted to the larger bar magnet because opposites attract. We can draw an arrow in this direction, showing the force that the smaller bar magnet feels due to the larger bar magnet. If we do the same again, we know that this time the two magnets will repel each other because they're both, um, the, both the north poles will repel each other. And therefore we can draw an arrow in this direction, showing that the smaller bar magnet will be repelled by the larger bar magnet. Now, if we place a bar magnet like this, we can have a guess at how it will behave. So the two north poles will repel each other, as like poles repel, and the two north and south poles will attract each other, causing a rotating motion like this. And we can use this rotating motion to our advantage by drawing an arrow in the direction that the north pole ends up facing. And this way we can draw arrows representing a magnetic field due to the bar magnet in the center. And if we do that, it would look a bit like this. So as we showed earlier, the North Pole faces away from this North Pole as opposite, as, um, sorry, like poles repel each other. And the North Pole, instead on this side, will be facing towards the South Pole as opposites attract. If we join up all these little arrows, we'll get a diagram that looks like this. And this is how we draw magnetic fields in practice. Note that the um, magnetic field lines loop from North to South, as you can see here, and down here as well. We can treat charges in the same way that we treated the magnets, and charged particles also experience forces due to electric fields. So if we use the same theory from earlier of opposites attracting and like things repelling, we can predict that the two charged particles at the top will repel each other, like so, because they have the same charge, and the two oppositely charged particles below will attract each other. We can use this theory again, to draw electric field lines in a similar way to the magnetic field lines that we drew earlier. And we do this by placing a positively charged particle as a test charged particle in this environment and seeing how it behaves. Using the theory from before again of like charges repelling each other, we can draw an arrow in this direction, showing that the smaller test charged particle will be repelled away from the larger positively charged particle in the center. We can place this test charged particle at multiple different positions around the positively charged particle in the center and see how it behaves and draw arrows in the direction that it moves. If we do this at every position around the positively charged particle in the center, we'll get a diagram that looks like this. And if we join up the little arrows together, like we did before with the magnetic field lines, we'd get a diagram that looks like this. And this again is how we draw electric field lines in practice. Note that the arrows are all pointing outwards, and this is because we've placed a positive test charge particle in this environment. And this positively test charged test particle will be repelled away from the positively charged particle in the center, and therefore the arrows are pointing outwards. If instead we had a negatively charged particle in the center, the arrows would instead be pointing inwards towards the negatively charged particle. And this is because we still use the positive test charge particle as an indicator of the electric field that the, positive, that the negatively charged particle um, emits. We can also draw electric field lines for the interaction between two oppositely charged particles, 
we could have a guess at what the field lines would look like due to these particles using the theory that I've just described earlier. So again, if we place a positive test charged particle here, we know it will be repelled away from the positively charged particle. And if we place the positively charged particle here, we know it will be attracted towards the negatively charged particle like so. So we can imagine arrows going away from the positively charged particle and towards the negatively charged particle and the same underneath. And in general, the arrows will be pointing away from the positively charged particle because the positively charged particle will be repelled away from this positively charged particle. And here instead, the arrows will be all pointing inwards because the positively charged test particle will be attracted to the negative particle here. And here are the arrows uh, behaving exactly as we predicted. So you can see the arrows going all away from this positively charged particle and all towards this negatively charged particle here. So how are charged particles, magnetic fields and electric fields all related? Well, if we pass a current through a wire, we can create a magnetic field. So electric currents generate magnetic fields. And a current is just charged particles moving around. So the straight wire here will create a circular magnetic field. So if we pass a magnetic field going, oh sorry, a current going through this wire, we'll get a circular magnetic field like so. And this will come in handy later. We can also use this phenomenon to create a straight magnetic field line through the center. So if we create a loop of wire here instead and pass um, a current through it, we'll get a magnetic field line like here. And again, this creates a magnetic field line going through the center of the loop itself. Actually, this magnetic field line is the same as a one a bar magnet would create. So if here we had the north pole of the bar magnet and down here we had the south pole of the bar magnet, you can see that the magnetic field lines loop around from north to south, like I described earlier. So in this section, we've learned how to draw magnetic field lines due to, due to a bar magnet. Uh, we've also learned how to draw electric field lines due to um, charged particles, and we've learned how to draw electric field lines for multiple charged particles. We also found out that electric currents generate magnetic fields, and that a current is just the motion of charged particles. So let's bring this back to our plasma. Why does our plasma even need to be confined in the first place? Well, you may remember from the previous fusion tutorial that a plasma is just the conditions we need to create fusion. And we want to confine our plasma as this is where the fusion reaction occurs. A fusion reaction is hard to start up and maintain, as mentioned in the previous fusion tutorial as well. So we want to hold it and protect it so that it can burn for as long as possible so we can get as much energy out of the fusion reaction as possible. We also mentioned in the previous fusion tutorial that a plasma is a gas that is heated up to extremely high temperatures. And these temperatures can damage our material and equipment. So we also want to confine our plasma to prevent damage to our material and equipment. As I just mentioned, the plasma reaches temperature, very, very high temperatures. And actually, no material in the universe can withstand these temperatures. So let's compare our fusion machine to the sun, our very own natural fusion machine. We can see that the sun has no container, and this is because it's surrounded by a vacuum, and also because gravity holds it together, keeping the reaction contained. We need to find a way to do this ourselves on Earth, remembering that we're going to reach temperatures much hotter than the center of the sun, which reaches 15 million degrees Celsius. And again, no material in the universe can withstand temperatures that high. This is where magnets come into the picture, as they're a contactless way of holding the plasma. So magnetic fields can be used to hold the plasma. We talked about how charged particles are affected by magnetic fields. And in the previous tutorial, we discussed how a plasma is a gas that's heated up to extremely high temperatures to the point where it splits up into positively charged particles and negatively charged particles. And therefore, we can effectively apply a magnetic field to trap these charged particles and therefore trap the plasma. The handy part about this is that it works at high temperatures and enables there to be a contactless way of holding and controlling the shape of the plasma. So how do magnetic fields trap charged particles and therefore hold plasma? Well, if we imagine these lines going across the screen to be magnetic field lines, and we place a charged particle in this environment, we can see how it behaves and try and figure out how we can use this to our advantage. So if we place a charged particle like so, just still in this magnetic field, it won't have any effect on it due to the magnetic field that it's sitting in. And so it will continue to just sit there and remain still. 
if we nudge the charged particle along a magnetic field line, it will it'll still not feel a force due to the magnetic field and it will continue to move along the magnetic field line with no effect on it due to the magnetic field. If, however, the charged particle crosses magnetic field lines like so, then the charged particle will feel a force due to the magnetic field. It will cause the charged particle to move in a spiraling motion like so. So the charged particle crosses a magnetic field line and, that, and the force caused by the charged particle crossing the magnetic field line causes the charged particle to begin moving around the field lines in a corkscrew motion. This effectively traps the charged particle and the charged particle can only move along the magnetic field line. So to keep the charged particle in this orbit, we would have to have an infinitely long magnetic field line. And even a magnetic field line that extends all the way through the center of the Earth wouldn't be enough to contain the plasma for as long as we want to. So, as I just said, the charged particle is trapped in an area around this magnetic field line. And we can depict this area using this grey box here. However, in 3D, this grey box would be a tube due to the circular motion of the charged particle. So, instead of having an infinitely long magnetic field, we could just loop the field line into a circle and keep the particle trapped in the circular path, spiralling along it. And this would keep the plasma trapped for as long as possible, so you can get the most energy out of it. So here we have our looped magnetic field line. This is like if we join the end, two ends of the magnetic field line together. And then if we show the gray area again of where the charged particles would be trapped, it looks like this. And as the charged particles is just what makes up the plasma, this gray area kind of shows the shape of the plasma due to the magnetic field. So this shape looks a bit familiar. It looks like a donut. And in mathematics, a donut is called a torus. The donut shape is called a torus. This is actually the shape of Jet, a fusion machine we have here at Cullen. You can see this image here, um, and in this image it looks like the donut is cut in half, and this is actually our uh, Jet at Cullen. Here's another image of Jet from above, and this looks a bit more like a donut, as you can see the ring of plasma here, and the hole in the center. So, We've made a magnetic field to contain our plasma, but actually it's not perfect yet. And this is because the force is stronger in the center of the donut. So around the center here, the magnetic field is much, much stronger than it is on the outside of the donut here. This means that the particles are being thrown towards the outside of the donut. So we have a plasma that leaks out of the edges of the donut. If you imagine a bucket being spun above your head, the water in the bucket is being thrown to the bottom of the bucket and held in place by the bottom of the bucket. And this is what stops you from being soaked by the water. Similarly, the plasma is spinning round and round in this donut shaped container, but the plasma is being thrown towards the outside of the donut. And we need to figure out a way to stop it from leaking out in the way like using the bottom of the bucket to stop it from leaking. So to stop the plasma being thrown out of the edge of the, of the donut, we can induce a current in our plasma. And this electric current improves our magnetic confinement. We can do this by using a big transformer coil down the center of the donut. If you watch the next fusion tutorial, you can find out a bit more about transformers and how they work and how inducing a current in the plasma heats up the plasma itself. If we remember from previously that an electric current is just the movement of charged particles, and we know that our plasma is made up of charged particles. So here, our plasma is behaving like a loop of wire, like we saw earlier. So if we induce a current, the charged particles start moving like so, and our plasma is basically the wire. So this, this current creates a magnetic field that loops through the center of the donut. So if we uncurl the donut like so, the magnetic field lines would look like the red lines here, looping through the center of the donut. So in addition to the magnetic field lines we looked at that go around the donut the long way, that look like this, we have a magnetic field that loops around the short way through the center of the donut hole. And these combined together create a twisty magnetic field like so. And this holds the plasma a lot better and keeps the plasma a lot more stable. It also means that we can stop the plasma being flung towards the outside of the donut and therefore reduce the leakiness of the donut shaped plasma. And therefore, we can have a plasma that burns for longer and get more energy out of it. 
If we draw all the field lines around the donut, it would look a bit like this. So these magnetic fields combine together to make a plasma that looks like what we have here at Jet in Cullen. This style of fusion using these magnetic confinement methods is called a tokamak. And this is a Russian acronym, which basically means a torus-shaped fusion reactor or a donut-shaped fusion reactor. You can see that these blue D-shaped coils uh, create, a um, create a magnetic field that goes around the center, uh, around the long way. Um, and this plasma in pink here is uh, then, then we have a, co a transformer coil in the center that induces a current in the plasma itself, shown by this green arrow here. This uh, current in the plasma then induces the magnetic field lines that loop through the center of the donut, as I mentioned here, shown by these green arrows here. And in total, this creates a plasma that's a bit more stable than if we didn't have the, the plasma current in the center. So now that we've learned one method of magnetically confining a plasma called a tokamak, are there any other methods of magnetically confining a plasma? And yes, actually, there are. We even have an example right here at Cullum, and it's called Mast U. This type of magnetic confinement technique is called a spherical tokamak. There are also other examples around the world, for example, a stellarator, this funky looking fusion machine. Let's have a little look at these techniques and how they differ from the ones that we use at Jet, the tokamak. Let's look at spherical tokamaks first. The spherical tokamak is based off of the tokamak principle that we used for Jet. It basically takes the tokamak's donut shape and tries to reduce the size of the central hole as much as possible. It does this by having the magnets as close as possible to the plasma, whereas in tokamaks, the magnets are a little bit further away from the plasma. This results in a plasma that is a bit more spherical in shape, as you can see here. It also looks a bit like a cord apple. The principles of the spherical tokamak in terms of magnetic fields are the same as a tokamak. But because the plasma is much smaller, you need less magnetic field in comparison to jet to produce a stable plasma. Let's talk about stellarators next. Stellarators are actually one of the earliest ideas for a way to magnetically confine a plasma. They were originally scrapped as they were too difficult to design. But after the leaky plasma issue was discovered in tokamaks and the development of computers and supercomputers, the interest in them took off again. The twisting shape of the plasma, as you can see here in blue, eliminates some of the um, leaky plasma issues that the donut-shaped plasma had that I mentioned previously. Because um, this plasma is a lot more stable, the plasma doesn't require a current going through it, as the twisty shape of the plasma makes it a lot more stable. Therefore, you don't need a transformer in the center of the accelerator, and as transformers require a lot of electricity, it makes stellarators a lot cheaper to run. In theory, the plasma could last for ages, but um, stellarators are a lot more difficult to build than a tokamak. Stellarators are often said to be a physicist's dream, but an engineer's nightmare. And this is because the stability of the plasma makes a stellarator a physicist's dream, but the complexity of building a stellarator in real life is actually an engineer's nightmare. Accelerators do actually exist in real life though. The world's largest one that is running at the moment is in Germany, and it's called the Wendelstein 7X, if you want to look into it in a bit more detail. So to summarize, we answered the four questions that we had at the start. What is an electric and magnetic field? Well, electric and magnetic fields arise when charged particles interact. We've also learned how to draw electric field diagrams and magnetic field diagrams, and we've learned that in general, opposites attract and, like poles or charges, repel. We've also learned that a current is just the motion of charged particles. We also figured out why we need to confine our plasma in the first place, and this is because it's where the fusion reaction occurs, and we want to keep it burning for as long as possible in order to get the most energy out of it. We also learned that magnetic fields could be used to hold the plasma, and this is because a plasma is made up of charged particles, and magnetic fields themselves interact with charged particles and therefore interact with the plasma. We've also learned that there are other methods of magnetically confining a plasma, other than tokamaks, such as spherical tokamaks and accelerators. And actually, there are other methods of magnetic magnetically confining a plasma that we haven't even covered today. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial and have learned something new. 
and I hope you would then join us for the third fusion tutorial, which will be about how to heat and measure a plasma. If you have any questions, contact us through our social media platforms, leave them below as a comment, or email us at communications at ukaea.uk. You can also check out our website, ccfe.ukaea.uk, or our European Partners website, eurofusion.org, for more information about the work we do. Thank you again for tuning in, and we hope you stick around to watch the rest of our series, and support us in our endeavour towards a fusion future. Thank you for watching.